hi, I'm Romain Guy, and uh, this is Chet. Uh, we, wait, we've done that. Uh, next. All right, so uh, the question is, what the hell does the title mean? Um, well, I can tell you what the title means. Uh, when we have to submit our talks to conferences, we have to do it months <laughs> in advance, and we're busy, so we have no idea what we're going to talk about. We have no idea what we can talk about because of our release schedules. Uh, so we come up with those very fuzzy abstract titles, and the abstracts are often meaningless. Uh, <laughs> so that's one of them. Uh, so is, it means whatever you want. Uh, the previous talk was called Android Awesomeness because we spoke at a conference in November and the person said, okay, you'll give a keynote and I'll call it Ice Cream Sandwich. And we're like, yeah, no, because we have no idea when we're going to release this thing and we're certainly not going to call our talk there. So we called it Android Awesomeness because then we could just talk about anything. Um, what we meant with sticky GUIs was um, not actually the GUI part, but the idea of getting your users to stick there, make them actually enjoy using their application. So we threw together uh, somewhat of a, bag, a grab bag of um, techniques that you can think about uh, in the view system and layouts and performance and animations and GUIs in general to uh, create experiences that are maybe more meaningful or uh, nice for your users. So this is the agenda. We're going to talk about views really quickly. Uh, then a, a few techniques about graphics. Then uh, layout, we're probably going to skip that because it's mostly about grid layout. Uh, animation chat is going, is going to go on and on and on about animations. It's going to be awesome. Um, and we're, we're winding up in a half an hour, 8.45? Yeah, a couple of hours. Midnight? OK, all right. You're going to stay here with us all night until and we're done. performance. We, so we have a section at the end where we talk about some performance tips. But actually, performance enters into every one of these topics. You should always keep performance in mind. Don't you know, fret about it too much. but. Uh, part of making a good experience for a user is to make sure that it's a smooth experience. If you've got a nice, beautiful animation, that's wonderful, unless it's actually a choppy animation, in which case you should either improve the performance, or if you're doing something that simply can't be made smooth enough, then you should eliminate it. So performance is always something you should think about. Texture view, we talked about it. So we're done with views. Excellent. On to the next section, graphics. Did we talk about graphics yet? No. OK, so there's various techniques in graphics to add richness, uh, add capabilities, add uh, a more uh, uh, rich and vibrant experience for your user. Um, but all the time, you need to worry about performance. Think about what performance implications some of these graphics have. So one of the areas that you can add richness is uh, with gradients. So I worked at Adobe for a while, and it turns out that the gradients are supposed to be everywhere. I don't know if you've noticed Adobe products, but like they're just everywhere. There's this beautiful gray gradient in everything. Um, so obviously, you need gradients. There's actually various ways that you can use gradients. One is just you know a rich backdrop that, that sort of makes things pop out. But you can also use it for sort of pseudo 3D effects. You can use a multi-stop gradient on a button to give the button a rounded, a more 3D um, feeling to it. You can use gradients in, in shadows to have more realistic drop shadows, again, to make things pop out. Um, more 3D look to them. You can also use grading and effects um, for, say, picture reflection. So I wrote a blog, I think you did too, uh, doing reflection effects using gradients um, with an alpha gradient to sort of uh, show the reflection of the picture in a more realistic way than simply copying and reversing the image below it. Um, so if you want to know how to use gradients, they're very easy. Maybe you don't use them because you think they're complicated. In fact, they're not. Um, so here's a little bit of XML to show you how I created a simple gradient that goes from white to light gray. Uh, so angle 270 means it's going to be a vertical gradient. It's going to start at the top and go down. Starts from a color of white, goes to a color of light gray, and it's going to be a linear gradient versus a, a circular or radial gradient. So um, you can use that code, but pick good colors. Don't use white and gray. That's just that guy. doesn't like my colors. My animations rock, but apparently my colors suck. Uh, so if you have a drawable file defined as above, then you would include this in a particular ca uh, container as the background to it um, by just referencing the resource. So there you're done. That container has a gradient. If you wanted to do it uh, programmatically instead um, in Java code, then you could define an array with the two colors that you want, and then you could create this new gradient drawable um, such as we did on the slide here. We're talking about resolution? I'm okay. tired. So, Resolution is another area you should keep in mind for graphics. Um, more from an artifact standpoint, be aware of what resolutions you're writing your application for, what resolutions your user might see your application in, uh, and put your resources in the correct directory and create them 
uh, in an appropriate resolution. So um, let's see an artifact here. So uh, we paid an artist a lot of money to come up with a very professional artwork here. Um, these are two representations. These actually both look awful because they're both scaled up so you can see it on the slide. Um, but on the screen, this was done, uh, this was a smaller version that was very crisp. It was done pixel perfect for the amazing art that the artist produced. Um, this other one was scaled up to twice as big as it should have been. And the reason was because it was put in the wrong directory. It was basically grabbed from the wrong resource directory. So if we see the code here, um, the, the one on the top was, uh, it was a file called Smiley, and it only existed in this drawable directory, which is basically the same as putting it in drawable MDBI. I was running this on a Galaxy Nexus, um, so it was actually trying to look for drawables in a native resolution of XHDPI. So the next uh, image view actually grabbed a drawable with this file name, Smiley XHDPI, and it grabbed it from the correct directory. When it grabs it from the wrong directory, it will auto scale it to the resolution uh, that's native to the device, which is why we get the scaling artifact up at the top. So pay attention to resolution and do the right thing. Again, there's articles and resources uh, in the SDK and on the Android blog to do this. 32-bit um, images are basically the format that you should use. This is what you get by default when you create uh, windows for your application. Those are 32-bit windows. When Starting you load with gingerbread. In. Starting with gingerbread, very important point. Um, prior to gingerbread, we would actually create 16-bit windows. And if you loaded a bitmap with no format specified? 16 bits if it's opaque. Right. Um, so you would, get, you would get a 565 or a 16-bit image. Uh, if you loaded a, a transparent one, uh, 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 image with translucency like a ping file, then you would get 444, or uh, no, you no, didn't get 32-bit, 8888. Uh, starting with gingerbread, you get 32-bit images in both cases, both for the windows that we create as well as for the bitmaps that we load. You can specify images with lower resolution, uh, with lower color depth, um, but please don't um, because you'll basically get artifacts. Maybe you can't tell, but I bet your users can. So can you, can you see in the back the difference between the three, uh, if you look at the gray column? Okay. Especially on the, on the gray. I can see it on the screen. I'm not sure if you can. Um, so the one up, up at the top is RGB 4444. Uh, so we've got four bits um, for alpha, red, green, and blue. And it's simply not enough um, depth to represent the information in a nice smooth gradient. So we get this banding effect, and you get these really awful stripes of color as you walk down the gradient. And actually, the technical term we use for RGB 4444 is crap. Uh, so it's now deprecated. So a, for, it, forget about it. It's a French word. Uh, yes. This is crap. Yes. Uh, it means crap. Um, RGB 565, so this was the default image format prior to Gingerbread. You can still load images in this format. Um, and you may think that that's the right thing to do to save memory, but please do other things instead. Um, maybe load less images, have less images cached around. Um, you can see a clear banding effect on my screen. I'm not sure if you can see that yeah, as can, clearly I can, here. I can zoom. Oh, we can't zoom when the screen's in this mode. Uh, but anyway, don't do it. Um, all of these images were uh, stolen from the blog that he wrote. Um, he has an application, so you can actually run the application and see the effect on your device. Um, and there's more images and more description of what's actually going on, as well as when to use dithering and when not to. Um, so you can check that out at the URL on the bottom of the screen. Translucency is a nice graphics effect to be aware of. Um, one of the reasons that you might use this is for fading things in and out. I find this to be a very powerful um, way to use animations when you're presenting new information or you're getting rid of old. Instead of just blinking it out or in and confusing the user, you can gradually fade these things out. Um, very powerful, so it's nice to be able to know how to use it. One of the things to be aware of is that it's expensive. Basically, when you're telling us to draw something with alpha, which is what we do to, to draw things translucently, then we're basically creating a temporary buffer, we're drawing this thing into it, and then we're copying it onto the screen. The system is doing a lot more work to draw it onto the screen. Um, we're doing what's called overdraw, because we essentially draw all of these pixels more than one we're, month. We're drawing the stuff behind it, and then we're drawing the stuff in the translucent view itself, uh, and then copying it onto the screen. And actually, um uh, it, it, it's very important. This morning, I fixed a bug in, uh, in Android 4.0 uh, at work where we had a, a performance issue and animation was not as smooth as it should be. Uh, and the reason was the application was uh, using translucency too much and uh, in the wrong way, and we'll come back to, to, to that. Uh, and in just, uh, what, two or three lines of code, I just changed two or three lines of code to, uh, to limit the, uh, the impact of translucency and the application was uh, six times faster. 
so alpha can be very expensive. Be careful when you use it. Make sure you profile. Make sure you test your application. Uh, same thing with the notification panel that we saw before. Um, I worked on a performance issue there with scrolling notifications up and down where we were getting probably 15 frames a second. It felt very choppy and awful. Um, and it turned out the bug was that someone wanted dim gray text. So they had white text that they set an alpha on. And it turned out that text occupied most of each of the notification items. Um, and it ended up causing overdraw the whole, on the whole screen and causing us to do a lot more work than we really needed to. Um, it turns out that just drawing gray text was cheaper than drawing white text and making us fade it for you. Um, and that sped it up to 60 frames a second. So little simple things to be aware yeah. of. Use translucency when you need to, but be aware of the cost. The, the bug I fixed this morning was very similar. The application was trying to fade a white rectangle. So it put a white picture in an image view and then was changing the alpha of the image view. Well, instead, you can just you know, change the color of the rectangle uh, to, to have an alpha itself. So we don't have to do that whole fancy uh, crazy thing that we're going to talk about in details. So if you want to use a fading effect, um, if you're doing this uh, prior to 3.0, before the new animation system, which everybody should be using now, um, then you would do something like create the alpha animation and say, OK, I want to fade um, from a value of 1 to a value of 0. I'm going to uh, set a duration of 300 milliseconds. Uh, and then I'm going to start the animation. Um, in the new animation system, it's a bit easier. Uh, this is using the new view property animator uh, that came online in 3.1. You can simply say, OK, for the object I want to fade, I want to animate the alpha property, go to 0, uh, start now. Um, and there's an article that covers exactly this uh, linked at the bottom. Uh, the slides will be posted online, so don't worry if you can't write down all those links. Uh, in fact, I think a version of these is already posted. Uh, yes, uh, on yeah. your blog. The, uh, I posted uh, slides from DevOx um, last week on my blog. Uh, so you can already find a version of these. Um, 3D, another nice graphical effect. Um, don't use it too much. It turns out we still like uh, 2D interactions for the most part on their screens. We use it in very subtle ways um, and transient ways in the UI. One of the reasons to not use it too much is because you might confuse the user. Another reason is because it does cost performance. So again, like alpha, be aware of what it's costing. So uh, we have 3D here, for instance, when we reach the end of the workspace, uh, we apply this little 3D effect on the, on the widget. Uh, it's very easy. There's an API on view. You just say view.setrotation uh, x or set rotation y. Um, we have a similar effect here. When, you, when I go from page to page, we have this 3D looking effect. It's just a scale and a fade, uh, but it looks very much uh, like 3D. Uh, when you turn the pages of a book, um, we, so, that, so what we just saw were just um, transformations on views. Uh, this is using OpenGL. It's actually using render scripts. So this is real, what we call real 3D. Um, so it's a lot more work to do, but you know, it can look really nice, very natural. Um, we have the same effect, I believe, in, let me find YouTube. Uh, YouTube, where are you? YouTube, you are here. Why is after V? Yeah, the English alphabet is hard. Ah, it doesn't do it. On tablet, it does it. On tablet, you have a nice carousel uh, in 3D. So we use 3D uh, throughout the UI, but it's in a very uh, simple and uh, very often subtle ways, but the interaction is always 2D. Some simple ways uh, that you can access, uh, you can get 3D effects in your application. Some of them are actually 2D. They just happen to look uh, 3D. For instance, the gradient that I mentioned before, there's ways to use these 2D gradients to actually make things look three-dimensional and really pop out visually from the screen. You can also simply scale things. So when we go from the launcher screen into the all app screen, the uh, apps on the home screen, the home screen itself goes into the background, and then the all apps fades in. Well, that's just doing a fade and a scale. It's not actually doing anything in 3D at all. Um, there's other ways that you can do things that are more physically 3D, such as rotating. So the little blue fade that we saw as we reached the end of the home screen on the left or the right, um, that's actually doing a rotation Y around the Y axis uh, of the view container. Um, you can also set the camera distance, which changes the, the perspective distortion that's applied when things actually rotate in 3D. Um, you can use full-on 3D using RenderScript or OpenGL. Uh, either from the SDK level or for OpenGL, you can use it uh, at the NDK level as well. So that's what games do. If you're, if you're using a 3D uh, game on your system, chances are it's using one of these approaches where it's going full on and actually writing 
you know, matrix-driven 3D uh, uh, scene graphs um, rendering uh, a little bit more than we do in the UI, which is really simplistic effects for GUIs. Um, consistency uh, is kind of important. Um, make things look consistent across your application, but maybe across the system as well, which is uh, why we provided the hollow theme, so that that can, uh, can provide some level of consistency across different devices um, and across your application, the system itself. Um, and there's, uh, there was new additions to something, what's the assets? The Asset Studio. Uh, um, Asset Studio. Yeah, so to help with consistency now in uh, the Eclipse plugin, ADT, we have a tool called Asset Studio that will generate for you icons for notifications, for tabs, um, uh, various icons also for the launcher, and it will generate different icons based on the API level. So if you want to, to have notification icon that works on Froyo and on Gingerbread and on Honeycomb, uh, you can just supply your, your vector art and it will generate different versions of the icon with different styles that will match the platform. It will automatically create the, the directories for you so you don't have you know, anything to do. Uh, so you can also use it outside of Eclipse if you look for the uh, Android Asset Studio. There's a website, uh, it's, it's a web application, you just drop your, your icons and it will generate everything for you. Uh, it's the best way to, to match uh, what we do in the platform. Um, so speaking of, of consistency, uh, when, you do, when you create your layouts, uh, try to follow the guidelines. Uh, we don't have many guidelines out there yet. Uh, we're working hard on them. Uh, but when you don't know what to do, just look at some of the standard applications. Look at Gmail, uh, look at you know, maybe the browser, and, and try to do what they do. Uh, Gmail is usually uh, my, my frame of reference. Um, and you probably, uh, I hope you've, well actually I hope you did not notice, uh, but in ICS all the apps look very much the same. Uh, so at the top, we always have an action bar. So we use the action bar for navigation. Uh, you can use that uh, to switch between different accounts. So you can have tabs, you can have a Dropbox. Um, you have a home button. So here, for instance, in Google Talk, if I click on the, on the talk icon, I go back to the home screen of the application. So you don't have to click back, 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 back a bunch of times. Um, you can put all your, your actions in the, in the action bar. If they overflow, you have access to the pop-up menu that we discussed before. Use the action bar. Uh, if you are not running on Honeycomb and up, there's an open source project called Action Bar Sherlock uh, that recreates the action bar for versions of Android prior to uh, 3.0. So you can use Action Bar Sherlock to make your application uh, look like those. Retro uh, Action Bar. Pardon? Retro mm -hmm. Action The Retro Action Bar. Uh, also use the View Pager. So the View Pager is a widget that's part of the support library. The support library works from uh, Donut all the way to uh, ICS. Uh, and the view pager is that component that you can use to swipe between different views in your different pages in your application. Uh, so if you want to have that same ICS feel, if you want to have you know different views and you want easy access for the user, stop using uh, the tab host and tab view and things like that. Use the view pager; it's a lot better and it works uh, on multiple versions of the platform. Uh, so go take a look at the support library. There's also a great uh, sample application. Uh, this is the Google I/O schedule application. Uh, it shows you how you can create an application that works on multiple versions of the platform uh, and uh, that's using the right uh, uh, UI elements for tablets and phones. So it's a single APK that works on multiple versions of the platform, looks great on tablets running Honeycomb, looks great on ICS, looks great on Froyo, looks great on Gingerbread. Uh, so go take a look at it. Um, if you just look for Google I.O. schedule uh, on code.google.com, you will find the application. Uh, grid layout, uh, we can, Skipped. yeah, it's the same Skipped. slide. Skip. Animation. Let's talk about animation. <laughs> so, what a uh, surprise. this is a section, this is um, slightly fluffy, uh, no code. These are principles that I've thought about over the last several years when I've worked on several different animation frameworks. Yeah, Chet has an awesome scam. He goes from company to company <laughs> and recreates the same APIs. <laughs> He's going to run out of companies at some point because. <laughs> I don't know, maybe uh, StackMob wants an animation framework. <laughs> uh, so one reason to uh, add animation to your API is to add richness, but um, don't make it superfluous, right? Don't make your users go, oh, nice animation. Could I just get on and use the damn application? So what you want to do is have animations that are helpful instead. You want to make your users more productive, not more um, hateful. Uh, you want them to understand what's going on in your application. If there's an important status that they should know about, maybe you could use a little bit of subtle animation to inform that about that, uh, about that information. 
instead of just popping it up there where they may not see it, maybe you, know, you can animate it into place and it's going to be a little more obvious. Uh, you can also use it um, in segueing between different states of a UI. UIs can be really complicated. If you're just blinking information in and out, it's a little bit hard to understand what's going on. Um, and animation can help the user understand shared information between states or information that goes away or comes into being. So animation can be very powerful. Uh, it's just important to use it for those uh, cases where it is actually important and is doing something useful. Um, and it's also important to do it in a natural and very quick way so that it feels natural um, and provides information but doesn't get in the way of the user. So one of the principles certainly is to make it fast. Get the damn thing over with as quick as possible. Now this is not a specific value. I can't say, you know, make it 300 milliseconds. 300 milliseconds happens to be the default value that we picked for animator in the new system, but that's not the right duration for every animation. It really depends on what's going on. For example, if you're moving uh, a view sort of 10 pixels to the right and you take a third of a second to do it, that's too long, right? You can probably base the duration on the amount of distance that that button has to cover. Um, on the other hand, if you're moving it down to the lower right corner on a tablet, maybe 300 milliseconds is really quick. It's going to feel rushed if it races over there. Um, if you've got a complex choreography, maybe you want to move some items out of the way and then fade something in, then that overall duration is going to be longer than a default that you might use for simply shifting a view over. So uh, the, the right answer here is make it as fast as you can while still feeling natural and smooth. Yeah, in my experience, every time I write animations, uh, the duration I choose, it's very hard to guess what the duration is going to be like. You know, my brain doesn't know what 900 milliseconds mean. Uh, so every time I, you know, I set my duration, and the first thing I do is lower that number, try it, lower the number, try it, lower the number, and you keep lowering it until it's, it's too fast. Uh, but you will pretty much always choose a duration that's too long by default. So one of the uh, other there's factors... A quick, there's a question. Sorry. Do you vary yeah. duration by device? You kind of alluded to tablets. Do we vary duration by device? Uh, we do have that possibility in our build system. Uh, so I believe that some animation might be different by device, uh, but I don't, most of them are not. Those are probably system values for the UIs, though, not defaults that we use. So the animator default is 300 milliseconds, which means if you write your application, you want it to look a certain way on a tablet and look a different way on a phone device, then you would need to set the duration yeah. appropriately. And a lot of the animations uh, that you see in the system, for instance, when you scroll a list, they're based on the, on the user interaction. So they're based on the velocity of your finger on the screen. So the animation, the duration varies because we don't even know what the duration is actually. So the speed uh, is closely related to the smoothness. You want your animation to look smooth because otherwise it feels choppy and non-natural. Um, so you want it to actually look organic as it you know, sort of blends its way across the screen. Uh, if you make a, an animation too fast, let's say, oh, I really want to get this over as quickly as possible, and you make it race down to the bottom side of the screen, it's going to feel unnatural because it's racing, right? UIs don't race. Um, but it's also probably going to feel choppy because there's not enough frame updates in the duration that you gave it. If you're going to race from the top left of the tablet down to the bottom right, and you give it 100 milliseconds, well, if you're getting 60 frames a second, you're going to get five to six frames a second at most. Uh, which uh, five to six frames a second total, which means for every one of those frames, it's popped a significant amount of space, right? Instead, you want to make that a smooth motion. Now, in that particular case, maybe that means it's going to take too long for the animation, but then there's some other techniques that kick in. So, for instance, if you look at the way we switch between tasks on uh, ICS or also on Honeycomb, we have sort of a squish fade animation uh, where we'll, we'll scale one activity out and scale another one in and fade it at the same time. Um, now, if we did that, yeah, why don't, we, why don't we check this out? So it's hard to see. Yeah, you yeah. can see that, that, that squish effect, that, that little scale effect. Um, and the scale effect doesn't start at zero. It doesn't go from zero to 100%. It starts, I believe, at 50%, maybe, okay. uh, something like that. But the idea is it would take too long to, to go in a smooth way from 0% to 100%. So we start uh, completely transparent at 50% of the size, and then we start from there. So the animation is still fast, but it's still smooth. Uh, feeling natural is important as well. This relates to the timing that you have. 
Um, in general, we don't move linearly in our world. Robots do, uh, but they don't live in my world. Right? We accelerate into movement, and then we decelerate out of it unless we hit a wall. Um, you don't want your animations to move linearly. You don't want that object to move from the left to the right of the screen in a linear fashion because it's going to look very robotic. Also, if there's any choppiness along the way, it's going to look much more obvious because your eye is really good at tracking linear behavior. Yeah, I actually find that fascinating because the brain is really good at doing that because uh, it's how you catch food or how you avoid death. Well, that was a long time ago. I think that now our brain is really good at that just so that people can complain on the internet about animations and applications. <laughs> so the important thing to, use, uh, to do here is to use um, more natural or organic timing. By default, we accelerate in and out of animations. Uh, in Android, this is true prior to 3.0 as well as in the new animation system in 3.0. Um, so that if you don't do anything about interpolation, then you will get an accelerating in and accelerating out uh, uh, feeling to your animation, which is usually fine, but there's a lot of other situations where what you really want to do is start fast and then ease out, or you want to start off slow and then accelerate out, maybe as something leaves the screen. Um, so again, it's just like the duration. There is no right answer here, except don't use linear, right? Don't use linear interpolator. It exists there. It's actually fine if you're doing a fading thing, because then it's not as obvious, um, the, the linear behavior. But if you're doing anything with movement on the screen, uh, linear is basically not the way to go. Make your animations simple. So I had a, an example before where we we're moving things out of the way and then fading things in. So let's say you have uh, a list of items here and you want to uh, remove an object and you want to fade the rest. You want to move the other objects in to fill the space that it used to occupy. Now you could actually fade that object out as, at the same time as you moved everything else around it. That would be what I would call an awful animation because there's basically completely disjoint actions happening at the same time. One of the problems is the, the graphics are actually going to overlap. You're going to see this fading guy overlapping with the other guys that are collapsing on top of him at the same time. So there's automatic noise on the screen, but also it's just different action. There is a removal happening and there's a movement happening. I would separate those actions. Um, keep the animation simple so that you fade this guy out. That's one action. You move the other guys in. You can overlap them a little bit so that as this guy is just at the tail end when he's almost gone, maybe the other guys are starting to move. But basically choreograph your animations to keep the overall motion as simple and as intuitive as possible for the user. Don't make them too noisy. Was there, is that a cough? Did someone have a cough? Okay, uh, purposeful. This relates to the, the first point when we got into the section. It's have a reason to have the animation. Don't just have an animation because it's cool. I like to play with animation code, um, but I, I don't think I would expose it to the users unless it had a reason for being there. The most powerful ones that I can think of are segues between uh, states of the application, using animations to convey information to the user, like this object is going away now, this other one is coming into being. Um, use them to, to help take the user naturally between these different states of the application. Uh, well, and just a quick summary, uh, the animations are hard. The APIs are pretty easy to use, but you should spend quite a bit of time tweaking your animations, tweaking the durations, making sure they feel natural, they feel good. Uh, we spend hours and hours, you know, uh, in the office, like tweaking every animation. Uh, it's sometimes annoying, uh, but it's definitely worth it. Actually, there, there's another example of um, what was it? The, the actually several of the principles. I worked on a performance issue again in the notification panel. We wanted to uh, have it so that when you click to the close button, we would swipe out all of these guys, and then we would close the notification panel. And there were conflicting constraints there, where we want the animation to be as short as possible but we also want the animation to be smooth. Um, and it turns out that if you're doing all of these things at the same time, it, uh, if you're doing all the things separately, then they can each be smooth. If you're doing them all at the same time, um, then it's going to be uh, choppy. So you can either have a short animation that's choppy, or you can have a really long animation uh, that's smooth. And I worked a lot on basically doing the animations separate, but overlapping them just a little bit so that we could speed things up, make the duration as small as possible, but so that we didn't have too many things and too much noise happening on the screen all at the same time. Um, so yeah, we do spend a lot of time on this stuff. Uh, so now just a bunch of tips about performance. How can you make your applications go faster? Because uh, they should go always faster. Um, the, the, first, the first thing you should do whenever you write code, and this is annoying because after four years on Android, whenever I write code for, you know, like I write small applications at home just for my own purpose on my desktop, 
I start writing my code and I, I'm doing all those optimizations that I used to do on Android and then I stop and realize, wait, I'm on a desktop, I don't need to do that. Uh, but that you need to do on mobile phones. So avoid allocations. Allocating objects, um, you have to run code to run the constructors of the objects. It's pretty expensive, but what's really expensive really is getting rid of the objects. Every time we have to pause your application uh, to launch the garbage collector, we're going to pause your application for a few milliseconds. Uh, so starting with Gingerbread, we have a concurrent garbage collector. Uh, so I think now the, the GC pauses are about two to three milliseconds um, most of the time. But in previous versions of Android, uh, a, a GC pause could be 100 milliseconds, 200 milliseconds. So if it happens in the middle of an animation or in the middle of a scroll, it's extremely annoying for the user because they feel like the application is sluggish. It's not necessarily the code that you're running at the moment, it happens. It's just, you know, the GC decided, well, it's time to clean memory. Um, so try to reuse object as much as you can. And do it in the right places. Uh, don't do it, you know, when, when user click on a button, in the button click listener, it's okay to allocate a bit of memory. Like, that doesn't happen very often. Uh, but in your drawing methods, in your layout methods, in the uh, touch event uh, handling methods, be very careful uh, about what you do. I've seen this, this error in a lot of uh, tutorials and books. They show you how to create, uh, how to override the draw method on view. And usually the first thing they do is create a new paint object when the draw method is called. Well, the draw method is hopefully going to be called 60 times per second. So you're going to create 60 paint objects uh, per second and they accumulate and then the GC will trigger and then you will have a pause and your application will feel sluggish. Uh, most of our APIs are designed so that you can reuse uh, objects. Uh, so here we have a very simple example. So I was talking about the draw method. Do not create the paint object in the draw method. Pre-allocate the object, uh, create it in your constructor, and then use it in the draw method. Uh, you can change the content of the paint as you go, so you can use a single paint, uh, but just don't create one every time. Uh, here's another example of API that's, that's meant to reuse objects. Uh, so this is new in uh, Android 3.0. Um, when you load a bitmap from a resource, if you know ahead of time the size of those bitmaps, for instance, you're creating a, a, a music player, and you know that every bitmap you're going to load is 256 by 256. You can pre-allocate a bitmap, and then when you use the bitmap factory, um, there's an option called in bitmap. That means you want to decode the resource inside that bitmap you pre-allocated. So that way you can keep decoding images in the same area of memory. So you can reuse the same chunk of memory. You don't allocate new objects every time. Um, so one, one tip about uh, lettering in general is use allocation tracker. I uh, used it very heavily to track down um, little bits of garbage that we were allocating during animations, uh, right? And if the framework is doing this, this means it has nothing to do with your application code. It meant every time through an animation frame, we were actually allocating objects, and eventually we would GC pause in the middle of the animation. Not huge, but enough that there was a noticeable hiccup. So I used Allocation Tracker to figure where we were creating these things um, and clean that stuff up. It's absolutely the tool you should use to figure out where your garbage is coming from and make sure that you can get rid of it if you need to. So you can find the Allocation Tracker in the Eclipse plugin, uh, or if you launch DDMS, there's a tab called Allocation Tracker. It's very easy to use. You just click Start. You play with the app. You click Get Allocations, and you will see all the allocations you've made. Uh, again. Most of our APIs uh, that are meant to be used in performance sensitive areas let you reuse objects. Uh, if there's an API that you have to use a lot and doesn't let you reuse memory, let us know, file a bug, file a feature request, uh, and hopefully we'll try to improve that. Um, if you use bitmaps, we talked about um, uh, uh, the 32-bit bitmaps. What's very important is that you should use bitmaps in a format that's compatible with the target. So if you have a 32 bits window, um, you should use only 32 bits bitmaps. Because uh, if you use a 16 bit bitmaps and you draw it on a 32 bits window, we have to do a conversion. We, we can't just copy the bits. Uh, so we have to do this conversion and we try to optimize the code for those conversions. But if you run that code 60 times a second, it's very expensive, it's gonna slow down your application. Um, so you can query the format of the target. Uh, if you uh, call, for instance, get window uh, in the onCreate method of your activity, you can query the format of the window. So you will know if the window is 16 bits or 32 bits. And then based on that, you can decide how you load your bitmaps uh, so that they have the, the, the proper format. Again, um, if you go look on, uh, on my blog, I have a long article explaining uh, this in more details. Um, try to use pre-scaling. 
Uh, this is a mistake I see in a lot of applications. Uh, when you set a bitmap as the background of a view, for instance, by default, we're going to stretch the bitmap um, so that it matches the bounds of the view. So if the bitmap is smaller or bigger than the view as it is on screen, we're going to have to do some, uh, a lot of expensive operations every time we draw the bitmap. So again, if you're animating 60 times per second, we have to do all this work again and again and again. Uh, so if you know that's going to happen, uh, just do pre-scaling. There's a method on, bitmap, on the bitmap class called create scaled bitmap uh, that will just do the scaling for you once. So query the size of your view, and if the, if the view is, uh, has a different size than your bitmap, just do the pre-scaling once, get rid of, of the, the original bitmap, and, and use the scaled bitmap. If you use hardware acceleration, uh, you're in luck because GPUs are really good at doing that. Uh, it's, it's pretty much free uh, to do the scaling. So if you're using a hardware acceleration and you're targeting Honeycomb and up, don't worry about it. Uh, you can actually save memory by, by having smaller bitmaps. As long as it looks good on screen, um, let the system do the scaling. Uh, redrawing, um, it's another mistake I see a lot uh, in, in applications, including our own applications. Um, so to repaint part of the screen, there's a method on view called invalidate. Invalidate means please redraw the view. Um, we also have a variation of invalidate that takes a rectangle. Uh, that is very important to use. Uh, for instance, let's say you have a, well, we can take the example of a text view. There's a blinking cursor in the middle of the text view. Instead of repainting the entire text view every time the cursor blinks, we only tell the system to redraw the part of the screen that contains the cursor. So you should do the same if you have an application and you have custom views. Make sure you tell us exactly what part of the screen needs to be redrawn so that we can save a lot of work when we have to redraw the screen. Um, when, I, when I was working on the launcher app, uh, the first time we implemented drag and drop, um, we had performance issues like the, 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 icons the icon was not following the finger when you were trying to move a, a, an icon on the desktop. And the reason was, er, on every touch event, we were asking the system to redraw the entire screen. The only change we made was pretty much to use this code. Uh, so this is how it works. We have an object at the next Y position. We know the width and the height of the object. Uh, we move the object, so we increase uh, its position by, uh, by some speed. Um, and then what we do is we set a rectangle to be to encompass the old position of the object, and then we use the union operation to make the union between the old position of the object and the new position of the object. That gives us a, a bigger rectangle that contains all the pixels that we have to redraw, and then we can invalidate that region of the screen. By making that change, uh, well, it was on the on T-Mobile G1 at the time, but we went from something like tw 20 FPS to 60 FPS when dragging an icon. I it's very easy to do in your code, and you're going to see like big differences. Uh, and it does matter even if you are uh, hardware accelerated. Uh, drawing requires to execute a lot of code. Uh, so the, the less code you run, the better it is. Uh, Chet mentioned overdraw before. Um, so overdraw is when you paint the same pixels on screen several times. Uh, a very simple mistake to do is, you know, I have an application, I have a white background because this is a background in my theme. Uh, I put a view. In my application, the view is field parent, field parent, it covers the entire background, and I add the background to that view. So I won't see the white background anymore, uh, but the system doesn't know that. Uh, so it's going to draw the white background, and it's going to draw your, your own background, and we've drawn the screen twice when we actually need to draw it once. Um, so overdraw also happens when you have translucent objects. If you stack a lot of translucent objects, we have to draw them all. It's very expensive. We touch a lot of pixels. So try to avoid that in your application. Um, and the, the only time when it's necessary is unfortunately when you use the set alpha method on view, when you want to fade the view. Uh, and I'm going to show you what happens when you do so. So let's say that you're writing code for Android 3.0 and up. Uh, you just write that line of code. It looks very harmless. It's very simple. You're fading a view. Uh, it's actually very expensive. So here's what happens. Um, if you don't have alpha, uh, let's say that we have a view with a background and two children. We just draw everybody directly on the, on the screen. That's really straightforward. Nothing crazy going on. Uh, with the alpha, we first draw everybody inside a buffer. So the buffer, you can see the buffer as a bitmap. Um, and then we draw the bitmap on screen. So we draw everybody once, and then we draw everybody basically a second time uh, because of the buffer. And the reason why we do that is uh, this. So in that particular case, um, when you have a background and two children, so here the background is this black circle, and the children are the, are the little icons. Um, if we were to apply the alpha individually to every element, we would get this effect here. Uh, it kind of look like, it, it looks like uh, x-rays. 
uh, this is not the result we want. We, we're not, we want the entire thing to be translucent, not each individual items. If we go through an intermediate buffer and then we apply the alpha to the buffer, we get the result on the right. And that's why set alpha can be very expensive. So be very careful when you use set alpha. It's okay to use it, just be careful when you use it. Um, layers, uh, it's a new API introduced in Honeycomb. Uh, if you want more details about them, you can refer to our talk uh, that we gave at Google I.O. Uh, layers, are, layers are awesome. Uh, they're meant to avoid overdraw. Uh, so the idea is that if you know that you're gonna need uh, to, to do the, the set alpha, for instance, but uh, things are not going to change. You can tell the system to draw everything into a layer. It can be seen pretty much as, as an off-screen bitmap. And then we're going to keep that bitmap around, and we're going to animate that. So if you want to move a list view, a list view is a pretty complex object, you can tell us, well, before you start the animation, render the entire list inside the layer, then please animate the layer. So for us, it's very cheap, because a layer is just a bitmap, so we can move that very easily. Um, Unfortunately, layers use a lot of memory, uh, so use them only temporarily when you need them. So uh, to use layers um, before Android 3, uh, it's called drawing cache. It's a method on view. So you just say set drawing cache enabled true, and starting from now, that view will render into a bitmap instead of rendering onto, on, on the screen directly. Uh, and if you want, uh, you can force the, the rendering to happen uh, in the layer by calling, uh, calling build drawing cache. Uh, it's completely optional. With Android 3 and up, uh, we have a new API called set layer type. Uh, and we, we needed that new API because of uh, hardware uh, rendering. Um, bitmaps are fine when you're doing software, uh, but we can be even more efficient when we're using the GPU. Uh, so you can use this API called set layer type and use a layer type hardware. It will create uh, a bitmap that lives on the GPU, so it will be even faster to render that view. Um, if hardware acceleration is disabled and you use that API and you ask for a hardware layer, it's going to basically create a bitmap. So it's going to be safe. It's, it's completely safe. You can use it all the time. Uh, and again, you can force the, the layer to be built by calling uh, build layer. Uh, and this is how you should use it. Uh, so this is an example of animation code. So here we're creating an animation uh, where we want to rotate a view in 3D. Uh, so before we create the animation, we set the view to have a layer because we want to render the view once in the layer and then we want to animate the layer itself, much more efficient. Uh, and then we add a listener and at the end of the animation, we discard the layer. We want to reclaim the memory. We don't need the layer anymore. So this is a, a very simple pattern. Uh, whenever you write animations with a new animation API, uh, try to follow this pattern. Uh, and we're going to try to make it a little easier uh, in future versions. Uh, yeah, for more, more information, refer to that uh, Google I.O. talk. So there's actually a couple reasons to keep layers um, or the drawing cache transient. One, as you mentioned, was uh, you don't want to take out the extra memory. But also, if you're actually going to change that object and you have a layer set on it, you're actually making us do more work. It's going to cost more because now we have to update the layer as well as the screen. Right? So layers are really only intended to be used transiently because of the memory issues, but also only during those periods where the object is not, being, uh, is not changing. So basically, if you're moving an object around on the screen, that's great to have a layer on it. If you're moving it and you're also changing the contents, no layers. Do you turn off the drawing cache enabled in the older APIs? Uh, yes, in the older APIs, you just turn off the drawing cache at the end of the animation. Um, and we use layers ourselves throughout the, the system. Uh, in Launcher, every time you swipe between pages of icons, uh, every page becomes a layer before we start the animation. Uh, use the GPU if you can or if you want. Uh, so you can use OpenGL, you can use a render script, and you can use the hardware canvas. So the hardware canvas is just this uh, new uh, rendering pipeline that we have in Honeycomb. We mentioned it before. You have to opt in. Uh, it's a very simple attribute that you can set on your application tag. Uh, you have more control over it. You can set it per window, per activity. You can disable it on views. Refer to the blog for more information. Uh, if you use target SDK version 14, it's the same. Uh, layouts, I wrote several articles on the, the Android blog about layouts and how you can optimize them. But basically, the idea is, uh, is exactly what grid layout is about. Try to avoid deep trees of, of layouts. The deeper the tree, the more work we have to do in the framework. Uh, and it can make a big difference. Uh, so I mentioned several solutions here. We have, uh, you can use relative layout. You can use grid layout. Uh, you can use the merge tag and something called compound drawables. 
I won't go into details. Uh, please go check the, the blog at d.henry.com. We have, a, or in the SDK actually, if you go in the uh, resources tab, we have links uh, to those articles that tell you uh, what you should be doing. So sometimes it's also appropriate to use a custom view instead. If you're drawing all sorts of little intricate things inside a container, well, maybe having a deeply nested hierarchy or even a complex single level hierarchy is not the solution. Maybe instead you could actually use a custom view to draw these individual elements. Yeah, the actually, sometimes when you when there's a when you have a particular layout in mind and you don't and you can't really make it work with your existing layouts, don't be afraid of creating a custom view or custom layout because you know exactly what you want. Uh, so it's pretty easy to do. Uh, what's hard to do is create a layout that works, you know, in a general case. Uh, so if you want to write a layout to be integrated in the platform, that's hard. If you write it because you know that you just want a star on the left and a star on the right and some text in the middle, that's very easy to do. Uh, my favorite example is Gmail. Uh, in Gmail, you can see you have the stars and you have the tick marks and you have the, the name of the sender and you have a, a, a snippet of the email. That's a custom view. It's not a layout. It's one single view that they create in Gmail because uh, they know exactly what they need to display and so a lot faster to, uh, to, uh, to process. There was a talk that Roman did at DevOx last year, which yep. is now <laughs> freely available on parlays.com, where he wrote a layout on the fly. It was about a half an hour coding exercise to write. Was it flow layout? Flow layout, yeah. Um, so you can see how easy it is to write a custom layout uh, on the fly, on stage. Uh, and speaking of layouts, uh, do profiling. Uh, if you don't know TraceView or Hierarchy Viewer, I, I hate that name, it's hard for me to pronounce. Uh, and I picked that name, so I'm stupid. Uh, uh, if you don't know those tools, how many of you have used Hierarchy Viewer before? Uh, okay, uh, so the, if you work with UIs, you have to use Hierarchy Viewer. It's meant to help you debug UIs. Uh, and the new version of Hierarchy Viewer also give you prof gives you profiling information. It tells you how long it takes to measure, layout, and draw your UI. So as you make changes in your XML files, it's very hard uh, by just reading an XML file to guess how fast or how slow it's going to be. So use Hierarchy Viewer. It will tell you if you're on the right path. Uh, and we have various talks uh, that explains more about uh, tools that you can use to profile performance. Processing, if you do a lot of data processing, uh, image processing, audio processing, I don't know, cryptography, uh, you probably don't want to use uh, uh, the Java programming language because it runs in a VM. The VM is pretty good, uh, but you can go faster. Uh, you can use JNI uh, with a JDK, uh, but let's face it, JNI is kind of a pain in the ass to use. Um, and also it has problem with compatibility. If you want to run on Google TV, for instance, that, that uses uh, x86 CPUs, uh, and you compile your, your native code for ARM CPUs for phones, it's not going to work. Uh, so instead, uh, you should take a look at RenderScript. RenderScript uh, is, is meant to do uh, heavy processing really quickly. Uh, it does the, the, the parallel processing for you using multiple cores. Uh, it's portable. Uh, and we gave a talk. Uh, yeah, the talk is available yes. online somewhere. Right. Not just for graphics. Uh, not just for graphics. Also render script is two things. Render script is to do rendering, hence the name render script. And it's for doing scripts. No. No. Wait, and no. it's to do what we call compute. Uh, so compute is just heavy processing. And the idea is that not now, but soon, hopefully, uh, we'll, be, we'll be able to run that code on the CPU when it makes sense or on the GPU if it makes sense for your script. Um, and we have, we have examples in the SDK. We have an image processing example. Uh, it's simple processing. It does, you know, it applies levels and curves and blurs on an image. Uh, so you can go take a look. It, it's, it's pretty easy to do. The compute part is very simple. And it's a lot easier than JNI. Um, the most important part about performance, try to be consistent. If you cannot do 60 FPS, don't try. Uh, do 30 FPS instead. It's better to do 30 FPS all the time than do 60 FPS most of the time. Uh, this is actually a technique that most games do uh, use on consoles. Like, there are very, very few games that run at 60 FPS on PlayStation and Xbox. Instead, they target 30 FPS because they know they can guarantee that, that, that frame rate. Uh, so if you feel like, you know, you're doing, maybe because of the UI you got, maybe uh, because of, you know, uh, what your client wants, you can't do 60 FPS, just, just do target 30 FPS. It's, it's much better. Um, and again, use profiling tools and everything. Uh, let's keep that. Uh, yeah, so performance. Uh, it's a big topic. We could talk about it for days, uh, but you guys would be tired uh, to see us talk. Um, you should look at, at performance throughout the duration of your project. 
Every time performance, uh, the performance goes down in your application, it's a regression, it's a real bug. You shouldn't wait until the end of the project to take care of it, because sometimes uh, trying to fix performance at the end can be very difficult. We all know the, f the famous quote, uh, premature optimization is the root of all evil. That's not what we're talking about. Don't try to be smart ahead of time. Just apply all those little concepts. Uh, they're not you know, big optimizations, they're just uh, good practices that, that work in every application. Because uh, if you have to do that at the end of your, of your cycle, uh, you're going to be screwed. Uh, been there, done that. And when you have questions, use the tools. Right, so these are the tools that you should be using. They're also the tools that we use internally. Uh, trace view, hierarchy viewer, uh, uh, hat or j hat, uh, allocation tracker, all the stuff is stuff that we use every single day for tracking down problems in the framework. Um, but you should be using the same tools for your applications. And we um, have a new tool in the Eclipse plugin called Lint. Um, oh, awesome. Yeah, Lint does, Lint is a, is a much better version of layout opt. It does static analysis of your layouts uh, and I believe some of your, of your code yep. and tells you what you could uh, fix in your application uh, to improve performance. So it will tell you, oh, here you're using a linear layout with an image view and a text view. Well, instead of doing that, you can just use one text view and it will tell you how. It will even, let, it will even offer a solution. So you just say, you know, please fix it for me. It shows you the before and after and you can say, okay, and it fixes your application. Uh, it does a lot more than that. Uh, it, it will tell you if you forgot uh, to translate a string in a, in a specific language. Uh, I don't know, it has lots and lots of features. I think you can go to um, tools.android.com. Uh, there's a, a quick overview of Lint and what it can do. It's a really, really good tool. And it works from the command line, so you can integrate it on your, on, with your build system, with your continuous integration system. Uh, so you can run it offline, you can generate HTML reports. Uh, and you can automatically mail them to developers before you do a release. Uh, for more information, we mentioned the Android blog several times. Go there to check out articles on all of this stuff. Uh, we each have tef technical blogs where we post stuff. We're also both on Google+, uh, where we tend to post stuff as well. Um, if you want to follow information like we've talked about tonight. And I think that's it. Yes, uh, so if you want to stay around and ask a few questions, we can answer questions for five minutes because I think everybody's tired. Uh, and if you don't have questions, then thank you very much. Thank you.